I'm uh, Chris Waddell. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University. Um, Rob Ford finally admitted last Tuesday to smoking crack cocaine sometime within the past year, five months after the video scandal erupted. Why has his admission come in so late? Well, that's a good question you have to ask him. I mean, I think I think it was pretty clear from the start that the Toronto Star had not... The Toronto Star wouldn't have run the story if they hadn't seen the video. And they had two different reporters who sat together and saw the video. And there was also Gawker, a, an online publication in the United States, who saw the video too. And, uh, and that person and people from the Star independently wrote stories saying what they'd seen in the video. So I think it was pretty clear that the video was actually true and video actually existed but I guess Mr. Ford was hoping that somehow uh, people would be successful at deleting the video or getting rid of the video so he would never have to actually admit that, that it actually existed. When it emerged that the police had actually found a copy of the video on a computer hard drive at that point it was clear that, the video, that he could no longer deny that the video existed. So I guess he had felt he had to actually tell the truth five months after he'd been lying. Do you think uh, Police Chief Bill Blair overstepped his bounds in revealing the uh, revealing that the video existed? Not at all. Not at all. I think the police chief did what the police chief should do. The the chief assigned serious and senior investigators to do the investigation. He, they turned up a lot of information in the investigation. They spent a lot of money on the investigation, which you could ask questions about whether Mr. Ford really should be costing taxpayers that money. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done it, but, but that turned out to be a pretty expensive investigation. But I think, uh, I think the police chiefs handled himself quite well all the way through the process. And his job is to actually do the investigation, assemble the evidence, and then turn it over to the Crown Attorney who will decide whether there should be charges late or not. And, and I don't think it's a, I, I think the police chief did the right thing in noting that there was a video. It was going to emerge at a court case presumably anyway, so, so I think it's appropriate. When Ford uh, admitted, finally admitted that he had smoked crack, he said that he hadn't admitted it sooner because um, the the media didn't ask the right question. That's ridiculous. It's a that's a ridiculous statement by Mr. Ford. One of many ridiculous statements he's made over the last little while. He had lots of opportunity beginning the morning in the the morning uh, the morning that the Star story ran, where he could have confronted the issue and said what he wanted to say. At the first first response was to say the story was ridiculous. Um, well, it turned out not to have been ridiculous. So what's ridiculous has been Mr. Ford's uh, unwillingness to comment on it and unwillingness to talk about it. As, as you may have seen, all the, um, the Globe and Mail has been running a series of editorials. The other newspapers have been running editorials. Council wants him to talk about it. He's refused to actually be interviewed by the police about this. So, I mean, I think the problem uh, lies with Mr. Ford. Do you think media covered Ford fairly in the past few weeks? Then? Uh, yes, I think the media have covered Ford fairly. At the, um, They've pursued Mr. Ford to try to get Mr. Ford to comment on a lot of issues. Mr. Ford could deal with all this if he would call a news conference, if, he, uh, organize, if they'd organized a news conference where people stood up, asked questions, he stood at a microphone and podium, answered the questions, and the news conference went on for half an hour or an hour or however long it took. Um, his unwillingness to answer these questions has become a big part of his problem, and he's been unwilling to answer questions all the way through. He's, the Toronto Star, over the last couple of years, has engaged in, has done a series of stories about Mr. Ford. Every time they do a story about Mr. Ford, he accuses them of being um, of wrong and being inaccurate, yet they've, not, they've been accurate every time so far. But, and that involves other activities Mr. Ford's been involved in, whether it's berating people at a hockey game, or whether it's driving his car, uh, reading a newspaper, or whether it's a range of other sorts of things too. So far, I think the media has been fair. I think Mr. Ford has a really simple and easy way to deal with all this, and that's to schedule a news conference and answer questions. Questions that the public needs answering, questions that council needs answering, and frankly, questions that everybody wants to know the answer to. So, uh, do you think just uh, expanding from Rob Ford as a not very media friendly politician, mm -hmm. do you, uh, is it possible though that media might be biased against politicians who aren't media friendly? I don't think, I don't think it's a question of whether you're media friendly or not friendly. I mean, I think the issue is that sometimes, and under some circumstances, public officials need to be accountable, and public officials need to be accountable by having people the media ask them questions and if they won't answer questions if they won't make themselves available then that's a problem and the, but that's not the media's problem that's the politicians problem so and, and too much of what we've seen these days is 
and it happens in Ottawa and it also happens in Toronto, is the accountability that used to exist when politicians would stand up and answer questions and would be available to answer questions has turned into people issuing emailed statements and not talking. And email, answering questions by email is really not answering questions at all. It's really, it's creating the illusion of accessibility without the reality of accessibility. Because you, an email, first of all, an email response can actually not address the question at all if it doesn't want to. Or it doesn't give anyone a chance to actually follow up with, up with, with supplementary questions. So, so uh, I think one of the ways any politician is held accountable is to be available to be questioned and to ask and to be able to answer questions that the public is interested in. And the media have traditionally performed that role. I think they still perform it and still perform it pretty well.